you pass along the river, you're exposed to life along the river. You'll see local people who build homes down on the river, very close to it, and are growing corn and banana plants and other food crops. You see two types of water buffalo along this river. There's the typical black water buffalo, and there's the one that's referred to as the pink buffalo. The taste of the meat is virtually identical. But the black one is much more popular. The Lao don't like the pink one as much because it resembles human flesh. So in markets here, you'll see buffalo meat with the black buffalo on top and the pink one on the bottom. Despite the calmness of the river, as it appears, it can be treacherous. Some of these longboats, if they do not make it back to Wang Prabang by sundown, they must stop at a certain village upstream because it's too treacherous to deal with these waters after dark. That's because there are rocks in the river, some of them hidden, some jutting up. Boat pilots who fly this river obviously know it like the back of their hand. And I suppose there's a, a fairly good track record because at least I don't see the banks of the river strewn with wrecked lawn boats. That sleek, modern, concrete and steel bridge you see up ahead is the China-Lao Railway Bridge. And our guide says that maybe any moment now, we'll see the train streaking across it. There are few more potent symbols of Lao's awakening than looking up to a new bullet train bridge from the bow of a traditional longboat. The river here that comes into the Mekong on the opposite side from where the caves are is the Nam U. Nam meaning river. So the caves are often described as the Pa U caves. Spell P A K with a silent K. That simply means river mouth, the river mouth caves. There are two caves here. I'm ascending a very steep step to get into the lower cave. This cave is filled with representations of the Buddha. There are said to be more than 4,000 Buddhas inside this cave. The upper cave, about 300 steps up, has its own different story. During the so-called Secret War from 1964 to 1973, Laos was relentlessly bombed by the U.S. military to try and stop North Vietnamese forces from filtering into what was then South Vietnam. 
So the relentless bombing here left many dead, but are also left many injured. And what I'm getting to is that this, this, this upper cave during this period was a popular bomb shelter for people fleeing American bombs. There are Buddha figurines in this upper cave, and they're very impressive ones near the back. The only problem is that there's only a, a single small floodlight on each of the two largest groupings, and so they're difficult to see. I don't have to tell you that the views from up here of the river are spectacular. The mountains and the river. There are very few people, relatively speaking, of those on the boats who hike up to the upper temple, the upper cave temple. And uh, I guess for good reason, as I mentioned, there are nearly 300 steps. More boats have arrived since I first came here. So the next goal is to find my boat. I think I see it. Ah yes, recognize my guide, Tim. We've had a, a wonderful lunch. Sorry I didn't show more of it, but I was just too ravenous. This is a, a gorgeous spot overlooking the Mekong River. It's actually an elephant sanctuary. It's just part of the, the tour stop, if you will, for lunch break. These look like particularly healthy elephants. guys are enjoying themselves. It's like a, a lunch break for the elephants right now. And 
and uh, I've probably been at it walking around with the tourists in tow. Oh, I have a friend I see that's come up behind me. Oh, that's the same. Uh, uh, well, not be quality the rest of the food the rest of the cost. Sure. So far, sure. What a beauty. Koi? 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 The falls are spring fed. There are several springs near the top of this mountain and others that decorate it all the way down. It provides the water that you see here. There are a couple of pools as you get further up stream, if you will, that are off limits to swimming. And that is because they're considered sacred for some of the local indigenous people. After a 15 minute or so hike, you begin to leave behind many of the people who have chosen to uh, encamp around the pools where they're swimming. The park built around these falls is divided into three sections. The lower park, which is of course the most visited, to uh, arrive first of all at a visitor center, more or less, with lots of shops to buy food and drink but they whisk you on an electric vehicle up about one and a half kilometers to what was the original tourist village just outside the gates of the falls. You're deposited there, you're on foot, and then there are well-marked trails, signage, informational, beginning from the bottom, which is where most people congregate to swim. And within a few minutes, you're where I am here, which is at the base of the main Huangxi Falls, which is really more than just a falls, but in itself, several cascades coming in from different directions, collectively dropping about 200 feet. And up above, one can also hike, although it's uh, generally discouraged, but one can hike all the way to the top where there's another collection of pools. And if you just want to make a lazy day out of your trip, you could come here and just uh, vegetate, eat, drink, and swim. The more you walk around here, the more easily one can find places that are not necessarily uh, overrun with people. People are no people. It's hard to come here and not feel relaxed. Not only by the, the beauty and the cool breeze, but by the non-stop sound of this water, which is like therapy.